Okay, welcome back for session number 10 of Learning Creative Learning. Uh, uh, as always, we have uh, the back channel chat going on at candy.media.mit.edu, so we hope that you all join in there to have discussions uh, during the session, and also we'll have time for question and answer later on, so hopefully you can use that to start to build up some of the questions that we'd like to share as time goes on. In today's session, uh, we'll be focusing on supporting creative learning. And it's you know, a pleasure to have with me Karen Brennan and Amon Milner, uh, who are two alumni of the Lifelong Kindergarten Group here at the Media Lab. Uh, but before diving into this week's topic with Karen and Amon, uh, we'll follow our usual practice of taking a look at some of the happenings in the online community from the past week. And for the past week, the activity had been for people to be developing tutorials using any media to be supporting others and learning things that they'd been exploring uh, throughout the course of the creative learning, learning creative learning course. And I thought there were some really you know, nice examples. We saw that Liz Hayek, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her last name right, sorry if I butchered that Liz, uh, did a comic uh, introduction to learning about Scratch. This is for uh, kids science magazine that she works for. And it was nice to see how she was sort of using the medium of sort of cartoons and comics for introducing Scratch. Um, we also saw that uh, you know Vincent Lamarca was using Scratch itself for doing tutorial for learning about Scratch. In this case, particularly a tutorial on how to remix a project in Scratch. Uh, so it was nice to see the beginnings of that. It'd be great to have continued conversation about that some of the advantages, disadvantages of different media that people are using for helping other people learn and supporting the learning of others about some of the different uh, ideas that we've been exploring in the class. It was also nice to see in the online community this week people continuing to do some outreach efforts around the themes and ideas in the course. Uh, one in particular that caught my attention was from uh, uh, Graciela Arismende, sorry again if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, from Mexico. I believe that's her on the right hand side of the photo in the nice blue and red hat. And she had created an open learning session uh, for people in her in the community uh, that was involving lots of different types of art activities uh, and exploring different learning opportunities through the different types of arts and crafts activities and thought it was some nice explorations of the different learning that happened and it led to some nice discussion in the online community. One thing that caught my attention with this is in describing it, uh, Graciela seemed to be almost apologetic for the fact that it wasn't using any technology, as she said. But of course, crafts are also a technology. They've been around for longer. In my mind, you know, the type of spirit that I got from the photos and the description here was very much in the spirit of the class. And although we talk a lot about the ways that new digital technologies can support creative learning in this class, I think at the core of the class is about how all different types of media materials uh, can be used to support creative learning experiences. So I thought this was a great example of building on some of the ideas from the class and trying it out in the world. Um, I actually brought to mind just this past week we had the annual conference for our computer clubhouse network. I know a few weeks ago when we had, actually it was the week uh, with Geeta Narayan and we talked a little bit about the computer clubhouse network and Natalie talked about the early days of the computer clubhouse network. There's an annual conference and some of the same issues came up in this annual conference where I was talking to one of the clubhouse coordinators who said almost apologetically that well, uh, the activities they were doing, they were making dolls and she explained how they made dolls using rolled up newspapers, bird seed, and pantyhose. And that really, you know, again, the fact that it wasn't using new technology, she was a little worried, did this still fit in the clubhouse spirit? And I thought it was totally in the clubhouse spirit. She had these wonderful dolls that the young people at the clubhouse had created, some for themselves, some to give away to others. Uh, so I thought it was, again, led to a nice discussion about what's the essence of the creative learning experience, or in that case, the clubhouse learning experience. So today we'll be talking about ways of supporting these types of creative learning experiences. I think it's, it's, it's really nice having Karen and Amon here. I think they, they represent two of the people in the Lifelong Kindergarten group over the years who have paid special attention to how to support 
the creative learning experiences out in the world. So it's great to be able to have them come back and share some of their experiences. Because you know, through the semester, we've talked about a lot of the technologies that have been developed in the lifelong kindergarten group. You know, technologies like Scratch and the Lego programmable bricks and Makey Makey last week we had talked about. But I think we also know that the technologies alone aren't going to necessarily lead to creative learning experiences. You know, in designing the technologies, we do our best to try to encourage and support and foster creative learning as much as possible. But I think we've all had the experience that we see them use some of these technologies used in the world in ways that don't align at all with the creative learning approaches that we've been talking about in this course. I remember soon after Scratch was first introduced, about six years ago, I was at a conference in Australia. And they were very excited to bring me to, they'd had a workshop going on where some people in Australia were running a Scratch workshop. And they thought I'd be thrilled at seeing what they were doing with Scratch. And I went in and I was horrified because they were just giving this, first it was this step-by-step -step instruction, everybody doing things in lockstep. And they're all doing things that could have been done 20 years ago with the logo programming language, doing simple graphic drawings on the screen. And it's not that they weren't learning anything. I'm sure they were. And there was, you know, there's some geometric ideas that were being talked about. But it wasn't at all in the spirit of what we had hoped for as we were developing Scratch. And I think we've all had that experience. That it's the technology itself doesn't always carry, you know, that, that, that message of an approach to learning or a way of thinking about learning. Uh, so I think today we really want to talk about that process of how do we support the creative learning experience uh, around, you know, the, whatever tools and media people are using. You know, we've done that over the years in some of our outreach efforts. We were just talking about the computer clubhouse, and when we talked about that a few weeks ago, we talked about trying to set up the clubhouse as a space that was going to support the type of technologies coming out of the Media Lab and other places, and to have people use them in really creative ways. But again, it's a mixed bag. We visit some clubhouses, and we see wonderful things happening, and we learn a lot about how to support creative learning by visiting some clubhouses. And we go to others, and it really is just a room full of computers without that same spirit. Uh, it made us a good segue into Aman, because I know when Aman was here as a graduate student, he spent a lot of time at computer clubhouses and also at other community technology centers. And I think a big part, when I think of some of Aman's contributions, there are some specific technologies he worked with, and he'll talk about those. But I think a big part of his contribution was how to go into these settings and really help to sort of cultivate a creative learning environment in these settings. Uh, so maybe with that, I mean, I'll, I'll hand off to Mon to give a little bit of a background about some of the work he did and the way he thinks about uh, both the design of the technologies and the activities and the environments to support creative learning. Sure. Thanks, Mitch. So I have here a slide that has an example of one of the extensions of the Scratch language that I worked on when I was a PhD student here in the Lifelong Kindergarten group. And what you see is a scratch screen with the project on it. That's an animation of someone sawing down a tree. And what you see also on the slide is a sensor board that lets you move a slider back and forth on the sensor board and slide it up and down. And that's what is used in the physical world to control the saw in this particular project. And you can extend that by adding a longer board or a ruler or something to make it feel like an actual saw. So you have a virtual component of a project which is a virtual tree that's being cut down because I wouldn't want to promote everyone going out and cutting down their own trees to do creative learning. So let's do it in Scratch. But you can give people the feel that they're actually holding something and sawing it. And with these two things together, there's an image of a chalk, uh, a stick of sidewalk chalk on the screen as well because what I wanted to do with creating physical projects that are connected to virtual projects was to give people the feeling that they're working with chalk or give that uh, sense that you're engaging in something that has a low barrier for entry. Many of you have picked up chalk before and drawn something on the sidewalk or on a chalkboard or even on your clothes. I don't know if your parents appreciated that, but uh, I did that sometimes and my mother supported it, so I'm thankful. And the ease of engagement is one of the things that I'm sure has come up in the class before, which is a low barrier for entry, being able to intuitively pick up something and use it to express yourself. And I think chalk can be engaged in a number of ways in terms of expressing yourself artistically, making games like hopscotch that you can play with others. And so it's an engaging medium that you can pick up easily and express yourself through numerous means. 
Uh, you can draw on your shirt and figure out where you like to cut out different patterns if you're a designer. But you can also do interesting design processes and transform the way that you think about going about designing, even with this medium of chalk, which is why I use it as a grounding for some of the work that I do. You can pick up a stick of chalk and use a thumbtack and carve out a sculpture in it. So you can do that and you can create a city around this sculpture that you've created and you can continue to iteratively design and transform the ways you think about this medium that's in front of you and the way that you think about design. So those are the elements that I like to think about when designing tools for spaces and how the degree to which it can be engaging, expressive, and transformative for the young people picking it up. The one thing I did, one of the reasons I really liked your metaphor of chalk when you developed it is we know that oftentimes, although chalk can be used in all those creative ways, in classroom settings, oftentimes chalk is not used to support creative learning. It's used in a very sort of delivery of information way. So I really like the way that as much as it can be expressive, it also can get appropriate in ways that aren't so creative. Uh, and the same with technology, which is the point you were making. In some of the ways, if, if a technology has been used in ways that are not necessarily conducive to supporting creative learning. It's always good to have the reminders to bring it back in the focus of what's important is supporting creative learning. And this kind of creative learning can happen in a variety of environments. So on the slide that you should be able to see here, if you start in the upper right, you can see a clubhouse, a computer clubhouse, and there's also libraries, homes, garages, and other places where this can happen. But one of the key components of what I call the hookup system, hooking up physical and virtual things, is that young people can find materials around them. It could even be chalk, it could be cardboard, foil, or Legos, and they can turn them into sensors, something that can detect when you're moving something or shaking something in the physical world. And you put that all together, and then the sensor board can connect it to the scratch environment, and you can control what happens on your screen. It really connects to last week, or the theme of the week was tinkering. And this idea, I think, here also is just using everyday materials that the world is your construction kit and just sort of making use of everyday materials as part of your creative experience. For those of you in the class sitting here today, as well as people that have tuned in week by week, this is definitely an honor to be the last week because you can build upon a lot of the yeah, things yeah. against the computer clubhouse has already been covered and tinkering with Makey yeah, Makey. Yeah. And what I want to emphasize today is the ways that you think about introducing technologies to spaces and environments, and you also have people and practices there. So as Mitch introduced when um, bringing me in front of you is that you have to think about all of these equally. And I want to have one theme that borrows from Carol Dweck's growth mindset, where it's not just thinking about uh, if a person can change from going to a static thinker, like I am this way and I can only, I know what I know and I'm this kind of person, transitioning to a growth mindset as Carol Dweck argues of I can learn, there's a challenge that I can develop into a new thinker if I accept challenges and go through different processes and I know that um, learning is a trajectory and I'm just not a fixed state, I know that I'm growing over time and that's an important mindset to support creative learning but I want to expand it just beyond a mindset and the way that you think about yourself because I think that the space and the environment and the tools that you use can also go from uh, an arc of growth and that's very important because computer clubhouses and the people that are there we don't walk into these spaces and have an empty slate um, there's an existing culture that's there um, computer clubhouses are often part of a community-based organization already that has its rhythm and its practices and you have to sort of grow that in order to accommodate a computer clubhouse as well as the generations of young people that come in there so I think this is a good metaphor of uh, I try to think of what ways can you grow and sometimes there are competing cultures that you have to work with and tools and activities can uh, help create new cultures and new ways of uh, creating uh, creative learning in these environments. So I think that... Yeah, I sort of like the organic way you talk about. There really is sort of building on this ever, it's already a dynamic situation that you're sort of feeding into. And I think over time we've often felt that these more sort of organic uh, type of metaphors fit a lot better than the type of engineering metaphor that you're sort of building an environment but or that you're constructing an environment. But you really are sort of having to you know, sort of interact with a, a living organism that's already there. Indeed. And uh, as you saw with Makey Makey, I think some of the ideas were that the tools itself, the things that you create, they should also have lives that, Eric said, you don't expect what is going to happen. You put it on the table and you don't know 
exactly where it's going to go. So all of these elements have growth associated with them. So this is just one of the groundings because we're going to have a further discussion. I don't want to dominate too much of the time. Um, but I see uh, computer clubhouses, the space, the tools, and the people as uh, an opportunity for growth. And you have to continuously do this and recognize the opportunities to do so. Uh, some of the other areas that I've worked in are, are fab labs where they differ from computer clubhouses in the types of technologies that are core uh, at their core and some of the practices involve bringing together tools that offer different types of creation, 3D printing, using cardboard to have a two-dimensional design on the computer screen and have it come out in three dimensions. And there's a different flow for supporting these kinds of learning uh, opportunities in this space, whereas uh, one of the challenges of supporting creative learning is how do you put the creative output of the people that are in the community in front of everyone. In computer clubhouses, you can see some of the Photoshop projects on the wall all around you, some of the Lego robotics in a particular corner. The 3D printed results, you have to have a lot of cardboard around a lot of stock materials in the space for the materials and the young people is a very uh, challenging balance in terms of how do you bring in the right materials for a diversity of learners, how do you promote what people are doing there, and can you show what's in the culture when you have a limited amount of space and a lot of different things that are going on. And when you have the materials around, the things that you see on the wall and the things that you see just going through the machines, there's opportunities to show people's failures as well, which I think is very important in these types of settings. We're not just trying to promote the perfect projects because you also want to give indicators of the process that people go to. And when you have materials that are being recycled and going through machines over and over again, you do get to see where people have made mistakes. I cut out a piece of this cardboard. This was way too large, or these pieces didn't fit together. When that piece of cardboard is in front of everyone else, people can see that, oh, they made a mistake. And then they, I see the steps that they took to correct it. So I really enjoy having things around that promote the failures that people took along the way to some of the projects that they created. And this uh, environment gives uh, a lot of opportunities to do that. So there are some slides that I'm going to get to later in the talk, but I'm going to fast forward through to Karen's slides so she can introduce herself. Yeah, they'll be the ups. Definitely could come back to this. Yeah, these, these, it's, it's guaranteed these will come up in our conversation. <laughs> yeah. so I just seeded a few things earlier. Yeah. Well, I do think one thing that maybe, is, you know, clearly a lot of the work you're talking about, a lot of work you've done has been in informal learning settings and community technology centers and, and away from traditional school settings. Uh, and actually, Karen's done work in both settings, but I think uh, she's had a special focus in recent years. Uh, in the work that's done in bringing Scratch to educators. And it's educators of all type, but it's had a special resonance with educators in all formal settings in schools. So, uh, which it brings some other issues about how to think about uh, cultivating and supporting creative learning in formal learning spaces. That's one of the aspects that I know you've been addressing in your work as you've sort of been building upon the Scratch community and trying to bring, you know, bring those ideas and to support the work of educators with Scratch. So maybe you can tell us a little about your approach to uh, supporting educators using Scratch. Yeah, sounds good. And I'll probably take a bit of a narrative turn of like how I got into Great. this. Um, and, but before I jump into that, I just want to say that the course back channel is like fantastically mm -hmm. distracting. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So I, I won't be able to pay attention yeah, to that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I think I might have told you like one of my favorite comments in the back channel all semester is you know, someone said. You know, you know, this discussion has been so interesting. I haven't been paying attention to the speakers at all, <laughs> which some people would think that that's sort of a sign of that we would feel bad about. But I feel good about that. Yeah. That people are finding that it's a, a great conversation great they're having yeah, so within the community. And great interactions. So that's great. Okay. Um, so I came to the lab as a doctoral student in 2007, and it was like the perfect time to come because uh, the Scratch team had been working. <laughs> basically had done all the work developing the Scratch online community and the authoring environment. So they had just released it into the world. So I got to enjoy yeah. the It got released in May 2007. Yeah. and then May two, I showed up in August 2007 just as the community, people were starting to find it and play with it and do really interesting things. So, you know, I'm like part computer scientist person, part social scientist ethnographer person, uh, part educator person. And so this was a really fascinating time to sort of appreciate how things were getting out into the world. And so a lot of my early work with the Scratch online community was, and trying to say this not 
not a creepy way, but like watching what kids were doing in the online community. And I had opportunities to interview them and talk with them about their experiences. And that was really exciting. And it was so exciting to see kids connecting to their passions and all of the process that, you know, Amon was talking about, like, the power of failure. And that was clearly evident in the conversations we were having. Uh, and a lot of the kids, you know, back in you know, early 2007 of the, you know, the lifespan of the community, these were kids who were finding it on their own or, you know, when I talked to them, like, well, how did you find out about it? My mom showed me, my dad showed me, and I'd say, oh, what do they do? Oh, my dad's a computer scientist. My mom's an electrical engineer. I'm like, okay, you were probably going to have good experiences with technology one way or another. So I said, this is an amazingly rich learning opportunity. How do we get it out to more people? So just before coming to the lab, I had been at a like an ed school, and I had been working with pre-service and in-service teachers. So I said, okay, like, relating it to what I had just been doing, what if we got teachers on board? You know, what if we could help teachers? make sense of Scratch and they could help kids who maybe don't have that type of support at home make sense of Scratch. And Mitch was like, sounds good, what are you going to do about it? I was like, okay, well, you know, um, what do teachers need? And I started getting emails from teachers, Natalie was also involved in that as well, and um, just saying, like, what do they need? Well, they were doing things, so they were sending us their stories of the cool things they were doing in the classroom in the early days. We weren't making a ton of resources. I assume you've seen, like, the scratch cards and things like that, and teachers love that, but they wanted about 10,000 million more cards uh, and other types of resources, and we weren't making those either, so they were making them and wanted to share them. Uh, they wanted to just ask an answer questions about Scratch in classrooms. And, you know, the, the reason I put this slide up is that when teachers go to look at the Scratch website, it's a giant repository and playground for building Scratch projects. And that's not the primary mandate of teachers, right? They aren't building projects themselves. They want to think about how to help other people build projects. So this, coupled with their desire to share stories and exchange resources and ask and answer questions, led to, I'm let you <laughs> uh, led to this project. So I developed a separate online community for Scratch educators called Scra Scratch Ed. Often <laughs> people are like, I love Scratched. <laughs> um, so Scratch Ed, and it had all of these spaces, and it's grown steadily over since 2009, so there are more than 7,500 teachers from all around the world, so it geographically mirrors what we see with kids in the Scratch online community. And the point of having Scratch Ed was to help teachers make sense of Scratch. <laughs> um, but there's sort of an initial challenge when many teachers, and I think people in general, take a look at Scratch. Their first reaction is like, oh yeah, that's a thing that you can use to build projects. So they think about, oh, it's about computer science, it's about programming, and certainly that's part of it, right? The authoring environment, non-trivial part of Scratch. But another part of it, it Scratch is also an online community. This is a preview of Scratch 2.0. Um, and so that's a different set of conversations. You're trying to help teachers say, okay, yes, it's about programming, yes, it's about community, but more importantly, and this is kind of the main mandate of the Scratch Ed online community, is how do you communicate a sensibility around aspirations for learning? And so what does that mean? I think this connects to what uh, Mitch said earlier uh, and you know, the comments about how chalk can be used in this very repressive, didactic, maybe not repressive, <laughs> didactic way, um, or it can be used for creative expression and all of these like powerful learning opportunities. And you know, as as Mitch is, I remember when you came back from that trip, and you're like, That's oh, so the horror. Uh, and some of it is that you know, a lot of people design learning experiences with Scratch based on the types of experiences that they had themselves. You know, so if you think about, I don't know what your experiences were like, but certainly my elementary, middle, and high school experiences were more like fixed rows, sitting, filling out worksheets. There wasn't, there wasn't enormous space for creativity and play. And so there's an opportunity for disruption with this. And some of the aspirations for learning are, you know, creating environments where people have opportunities to design, so the, the constructionist philosophy, uh, make personal connections, connections to what you care about and what you know, having opportunities to share your work with other people as a, you know, the power of audience and also of having collaborators, and then finally reflecting, because it's so easy when you're bogged down in the building, and I don't know if this is your experience, I'm looking specifically at the people <laughs> taking the class, that you get so bogged down in the building of things and the creating that you don't have an opportunity to step back. So 
and there are probably some challenges in supporting each of those four. Oh yeah. So yeah. And, like as you look back, which has have you found? Is there anything you could say about where some of the greatest challenges are that you say in trying to support these four different dimensions? Because to really have the type of creative learning experience you're looking for, all need to be supported, but it, there are probably some real different challenges with each of them. Yeah, they're all problems. Yeah. But they, they present very different problems. Yeah. And actually, as someone commented in the course site, is that they aren't sort of discrete elements. They, yeah. They're interconnected. So that also makes things more complicated. I mean, right, like, because if you work on something you care about, you're more likely to get into a designing approach. So if things are personalized, you're more likely to get people engaged as designers. Think, yeah, I think you know the sort of the very rigid structures of schools present challenges along each dimension. So like very mm -hmm. quickly, like designing, there's very limited time, and open-ended design needs time, so that's a challenge. Personalizing Common Core state standards. You know, how do you rectify the things that you're interested in with sort of top-down mm -hmm. aspirations or ambitions for, for learning? Sharing. The, I mean, this is a larger cultural problem of like remix culture and what is yours, what is mine? How do I give attribution? What is collaboration? What is cheating and plagiarism? And reflecting, there's just never any time. <laughs> there's never time for that. And I mean, there's a lot more complexity to that. But those are some of those the challenges, and that's just for but, students. Right. Yeah, and maybe say some. Because I know also you, one thing in, in the article that was proposed as a, read, a reading for this week, you also talked about how to try to support educators engaging in all of these activities as well. Yeah, because in that, in that article, and someone in the class also expressed a fondness for this quote from Seymour, but we talk about teacher training, and it's just such an offense because we don't talk about training kids, or at least I, yeah, I, hope not. I would be really reluctant to talk about training kids. And it just really devalues the, like, deeply creative, powerful work that teachers do. Teachers, like kids, are designers. And we just don't give them the space to do that. You know, it's like schools should not be factories, but we, we treat teachers with training them in that way. It's just kind of ridiculous. So, Can you Maybe just say a little bit more, getting back to the concrete with specific things with Scratch Ed, yeah. which is not just the website. No. But, you know, there's a whole set of activities with, you know, meetups and different, you know, webinars. But maybe going through some of the ways in which the work you've been doing with Scratch Ed helps support these four components, both for educators, but it also helps educators support these four components in the activities that they work on, you know, with the, the, the learners that they're working with. Well, I think, yeah, so the Scratch Ed online community has blossomed into a whole constellation of activities and forms of support. And, and that's exciting. And some of it's just pragmatic. You know, some people do not like online communities. Actually, sort of like as a deep irony, I don't even really like online communities. So this is, yeah, there, there's some complexity there that I don't fully navigate. Like I love the face-to-face, -face, so I'm like, okay, we also need to do face-to-face -face as well. So some of it is just different, different learners, different pathways, different styles. So different people are going to respond to different forms of professional development, um, and there are different affordances. I mean, you know, if designing is really important. Um, and for teachers, both at the level of learning how to use Scratch, because that's a non-trivial part of this, right? Like you should, it's nice to know something. You don't need to know, you definitely don't need to know everything about Scratch to work with Scratch, but you want to have stuff, some of that. <laughs> it cultivates empathy, if nothing else, for what the students are going to be going through. Um, and it's, it's hard to create learning opportunities just through the online community where teachers are building. So that's why we do workshops where teachers can get together and sit side by side and build things together. So it's like, we, we use those dimensions across everything with the Scratch at work. And some mediums are better than others at supporting different dimensions. And this idea of supporting uh, the educators as learners, or teachers and learners, and blurring the boundary is something that certainly comes up in Amon's work as well. Because you know, the work that you have been have done in the community centers, you always are looking at how the, you know, how the mentors play roles as learners, and that the participants in the online, in the, in the community centers, emerge into new roles as helping others learn as well. So maybe you can talk a little about that, that dynamic between you know, teachers and learners. Sure. In spaces like computer clubhouses, you don't have a role when you come in. A mentor has to establish themselves. If you're um, above the age of 18 and you want to help out, you don't have the credibility of already being a teacher. And so I think to Karen's point about feeling comfortable learning scratch, learning all the way or just enough to get something started, that's a very important uh, concept about when can you start an activity. And so 
just being in a space like a computer clubhouse as a mentor, you don't have to have all the knowledge of something like Scratch or how to work with electronics in order to get started with the project, but just entering the space and showing that I'm here because I want to learn as well, that's one of the most important ways that we, through the course of uh, the years in terms of helping mentors get involved in these activities, just you know, be a learner yourself, go in there, show that you're interested in this and excited, and then that will be the thing that is passed on your interests and people will engage with you as opposed to saying that I know all of the technology. So I just wanted to come back to that point because it's in the informal world. You don't actually have some of the credibility of being an authority in a space <laughs> that a teacher is uh, provided. So. And I think it, it can actually work against you. You know, I th when I came, you were further ahead <laughs> of me in the program, and that's something I really learned from you you know, as I started to make sense of lifelong kindergarten and was going to workshops and you were leading the workshops, I really, like, you you had this fearlessness that I think I would have been, like, a bit more reluctant to just dive in and, like, let's go for it. And I, so I, I definitely credit that fearlessness and, like, let's just do it and, like, be co-learners in that way um, to you to see it really in action. Because I think expertise can really actually get in the way that if you are the expert, you are going to just like quickly fix something rather than give the person yeah. the opportunity. And I really, I always saw that in you, just like you, yeah. Oh, thank you. That, that leads to the slide that is in front of the uh, projector right now. The constellation of connected creators is something that I was thinking about when I was finishing up here. After serving in a lot of roles uh, that you see here in this star for so long in places like computer clubhouses and fab labs, you're a creator when you're doing your own projects, but you're also a co-learner because you have to go in the spaces and learn alongside with the people because you're, at very minimum, you're learning about the space that they occupy more, so you're always going to be a learner. You're a collaborator because you probably want to go to these third spaces to be working with other people because you can be doing these things in your own home as well. But sometimes you're coaching. If you have developed some expertise, you can help other people coach. And you could be a colleague where you're not working on a project with another person, but you can advise because you're in the same setting. So these are roles that I've played, and as Karen noted, but I'm also looking to help the young people in places like computer clubhouses play all of these roles as well. So in terms of going back to the theme that I introduced of the growth mindset, you don't just think of yourself as I do X. I could think I'm a coach, I'm a co-learner, I'm a colleague. At different points in time, you're shifting through all of these different roles. And having a community of learners is important to bring that to light, that there's these shifts of these roles. And there's a time element, not just um, you don't play all these roles at once. Sometimes you might just walk, you won't walk in and become a coach to everyone else. But over time, you're a newcomer that to a community that someone engages, somebody who's already there, the person who runs the computer clubhouse, the coordinator, or the mentors, or the peers that have been a part of the established culture since the computer clubhouse opened. Uh, they engage you and say, this is the culture that's going on here, and I'll teach you how to do some of the projects that are here. And then they can cultivate you as a facilitator, because sooner or later, you're going to be one of the people that helps the new person that comes in the door get accustomed to the um, practices that are going on in the space. And so after you've been a facilitator of, hey, you can welcome people in for a little while, you can also identify when it's time to pass the buck, so to speak, and have those other people that you've brought into the culture after they've been there for a while. You can support them in becoming a facilitator as well. So there's a cycle in going through all these roles over time as you have an arc through a learning environment. Uh, you can play the different roles of being engaged as a newcomer, uh, being cultivated as a facilitator, and then facilitating others to take your place. And that's something that I've had to do uh, in several of the computer clubhouses and fab labs. I know, particularly, you also you've been involved in this project called uh, Learn to Teach, Teach to Learn. This sort of plays off of that idea. Indeed. This, these ideas were co-developed with the Learn to Teach, Teach to Learn program, where we have young people in a variety of communities around Boston come together and learn how to do some of the digital fabrication I was talking about, use a laser cutter, um, work with Scratch and program, do some physical programming with Pico Crickets, and also do graphic design, and a number of different capacities to try to reach as many interests as possible to have, give people the spark to get really into one of those aspects, or I really want to dive into this. Uh, and we give them the space to dive into a project so they can really learn some of the capacities and how to integrate them because we don't just go for teaching the concepts in their silos. We want people to be able to work with any types of um, materials that help them express themselves. And they could do a project that relates to their community. I'll give one example of people that learned how to fabricate something, drew a star um, on the computer screen, turned it into a sun just by twisting 
the points of the star, and then once it was a sun, they got the idea to make a solar collector where you take some of the solar panels and put it on this 3D printed sun, and then you can do the electronics to wire it into a charger for your iPod, so they can put this outside of the community center and give people the resource. So they're taking these things that they've learned um, and giving a resource to the community, but the bigger resource that they were giving each other was that they were learning how to do these uh, design processes, iterative design, and uh, work in the different capacities, and they also teach preteens how to think through these design processes, how to work with all the different machines that are in the space, and how to own their own learning and say, you know, you can provide something that's a community resource as well, so have them start to think that the way that they're doing. So this program called Learn to Teach, Teach to Learn has the teenagers working with the preteens uh, as teachers, and then when they go into college, they can come back and serve as mentors for the next generation of teens, which might have been the ones that they worked with when they were preteens. This thing that you're supporting, sort of the development of becoming a good facilitator, of helping people learn how they can help facilitate others in their learning, is something that I guess I've found over the years, it doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. So I think the roles that you're playing of really helping people develop as facilitators is so important. We sometimes see, of I know when I've, in the clubhouse setting, a lot of times mentors will come in and they'll be at one of two extremes. Like one extreme is, uh, like the example I talked about in that workshop in Australia, where it's sort of like this overly structured step-by-step, -step, here's how to do it. And again, the person who was leading that workshop had a lot of knowledge of how to do this and was sort of trying to convey their knowledge in a very directed way. Um, and so some mentors want to do that. They know how to do this and they want to con convey it very directly in a very structured way. And then you have other mentors who come in who really embrace what we talk about with young people following, following their own interests and knowing the importance of allowing people to follow their passions. And they'll like stand back and they say, oh, just let them follow their interests. And they will only intercede if someone asks them a question. So they don't dive in the way that you talked about of doing your own things to help and become a good co-learner. They're just there to answer questions. And I think both of those extremes, I say, is really are problematic of you know, either being overly structured or just saying, you know, well, we have to give them their agency so I won't do anything. Uh, I know this is one thing that you thought about a lot in your work, Karen, of, about that sort of balance or the tension that sometimes is there. And it doesn't, these things don't have to be at odds with each other, but oftentimes they feel that way in a lot of settings. So maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, and it connects going to the, the candy yeah. real-time chat. Um, I think this relates to two questions. So one question was when working with students that are, oh, no, sorry. Have you noticed any strategies, or even on a meta level, any type of strategies that have worked well for promoting meaningful creative learning experiences? Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to connect it to actually um, Juan's Which one? super diagram, the pyramid. <laughs> yeah, the, here. The, yes. With the other one. The other one. Yeah. <laughs> right, the super pyramid. The, the one that oh, two yeah, people yeah. and uh, practices. Yeah. Um, this one. This one. Okay. I think what I what I love about this is that. The, those all represent different types of structures. Yeah, and I think yeah. some people hear narratives about constructionism and about creative learning experiences and tend to think, and you know, some of it is historical, like, oh, when you talk about constructionism and creative learning, that means get out of the way and like don't intervene at all. Yeah, yeah and sometimes it's, right, it's been a problem. Sometimes the proponents of constructionism have, yeah. have, <laughs> have done some things to encourage that point of view, which is then problematic. Yeah, yes. like, Let's get rid of the schools, you know, yeah. and it and it's just it's a lot more subtle than that, and it's really looking at what are the ways in which structure can be productively put into place, and I think along each of these three dimensions, mm -hmm. you know, you can imagine, and just like with the chalk example, structures, these different types of structures can be introduced productively and counterproductively yeah. in order to support learner aid. Like, if the, what is the goal? You know, you want to support young people to have creative learning experiences. You want them to have responsibility and ownership over their experiences. So you could, if that wasn't your goal, you could imagine yeah. <laughs> introducing structures that amplify a more like, I tell you exactly what's going Right, and, and in fact, if your goal is to achieve the highest scores on a particular exam, then being very structured and yeah. having a very precise you know, sort of approach for solving these types of problems can that be very, very effective. Sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. And actually, so you're right. The goal to start with the goals is then is often lost in a lot of discussions around you know, education and learning that you need to start with being aligned with what the goals are. Yeah. And I and sometimes I feel like learning goals are are lost when we start talking about technologies yeah. and 
and different technological tools start to shape our aspirations based on what they are or are not able to do. And I think, you know, we were talking about this recently, and it's, I think it's a conversation that's very much in the air, technologies like, like MOOCs, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of what's happening with these massive online open courses, I don't think are particularly well aligned to what we know is good about learning, what we want to have happen for good learning, and yet that's, those are the affordances of the technologies at hand, so we start shaping Mm -hmm. Our practices in relation to the technological infrastructure, and I think that's where we always have to, you know, sh Sherry and like make sure we're keeping a, you know alignment with our human purposes. And I always sort of keep that in mind. You know, that it's easy to get shaped by the technologies, but like, no way. What are we actually trying to do? And not just about the technologies, but like, what are the practices and what are the spaces that we have? Um, and can I pull one more thing? Yeah, sure. So, have, um, when working with students that are expecting teachers to provide, it takes time for mm -hmm. them to adjust to learning on their own. So this idea of um, sometimes the kids, uh, that's what I wanted to ask you, like in informal learning environments, and certainly, so what I found, informal learning environments, teachers, in, even in formal, 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 yes, formal learning. Yeah. in space, formal <laughs> learning environments, some students really resist creative learning approaches. They're like, hey, this is not what I'm doing in the rest of my school yeah. day. Why are you trying to make me think independently and have agency as a learner? I don't want any of that. Just like tell me tell me what to do. Do you also see that in the informal learning environment? Um, just I want to echo that sentiment. Even at where I teach right now at Olin College of Engineering where it's, everyone is pre-selected to be working against that mindset. It's very hard to undo sometimes of teach me you know, exactly what am I supposed to be doing? So even in the, the best case where you're, you're there because you're interested in working on projects and doing a project-based curriculum, that's, it takes a while to undo that. So it's, uh, it's a very hard challenge in the formal settings, I agree. And in formal spaces, I think there are some ways to combat that in terms of uh, there are so many elements of any given project that the expectation can't be that one person is going to be able to teach you on all the different dimensions. And I want to bring up an example uh, that happened uh, before you actually got to the Lifelong Kindergarten group, which was the Digital Puppet Slam. And this was one way where you, know, you, you credit me for having some of these mentor abilities, but I was able to watch other excellent mentors and be a part of their, participate on the periphery, and then um, take on some of the practices that I saw from the mentors that uh, helped me early on as well. So uh, Edgar Gerasores was wanted to do something called a digital puppet slam, which involved a little bit of theater, <laughs> uh, a little bit of, he was a sound engineer, so he wanted to do the production behind the scenes, but he couldn't do the art or the, the, the narrative and, uh, or the technology to map a physical puppet to an on-screen puppet. So that's where I got brought into the project. But uh, there were all these things, and some of the young people had to be, hey, you know, can you make some of the stage props? Can you make some of the graphics? Uh, I can figure out how to make the sounds align for all of these things. So the expectation was that to create something big and do this event, we can, uh, you know, the expectation isn't on just the mentor that introduced the idea. You know, it's, I can facilitate a space where I'm going to need all of you to be playing a lot of the different roles. So I think that, you know, when you don't have some of the domains in terms of, you know, physics must be taught or computer science must be taught or and you could just integrate a lot of different things you can have something that's bigger than the expectation that one person is going to be able to provide all those resources and um, this example also goes uh, lends itself to changing some of the cultures over time because one of the things that you find in the clubhouse is that when you have an established culture of doing something like graphic design using Photoshop, that can be great to get people in the door, but there's a time in which uh, people that want to work on computer programming or want to work on robotics, or if that can consume a space because you have a limited resource, it's sometimes harder for other cultures to get in, so you can sometimes pause and have an event where there's going to be necessarily time to focus on these other things, and people that may have been going with what the group was doing, oh, I'm going to do Photoshop as well. There's time to expand into something else and give it space and develop the expertise so that um, that can be something that's a part of the culture thereafter. So this was one of the ways to help a community grow because you provide channels for some of the activities that may have been, oh, I'll, there's nobody here to help with this, or I'll just be doing the things that everybody else is doing because I come here for the social scene as well. So I think it played um, a role in helping 
the community evolved to do more things, um, which was one of the challenges as well, because sometimes the Photoshop culture is um, can dominate where it needs to give space for other things as well, especially over time. Now that 3D printing is coming to the fore, there has to be space for that to get into a community that already has existing practices and a rhythm. Actually, I think one thing maybe I'm going to suggest is the Karen's already been pulling some questions in from the uh, back channel chat, but maybe we'll take sort of a couple minutes to allow both the students here uh, at MIT to have some discussion among themselves to generate some questions to ask, but also allow people on the back channel chat to those who have been paying attention to us to pay more attention to the chat right now uh, and to, to have some more questions percolate up that we'll then address. And then we have the students here, maybe you can also join the back channel chat and add your questions there as well. And then we'll try to pull some questions from there. So let's just take a few minutes to give you the chance to pose some questions on the back channel chat. We'll take a look at them and then uh, we'll move back to our discussion. Yeah, of course, it's not quite clear about the ones I asked you about from being called house more quite clear. Well, here's one they're asking you to talk about. about everyone's approach to that makes sense to link it in with these themes. Does that make sense? That's gonna be the one who's picked up he's being read as Formal informal settings with creativity time and they're holding back. This has about strategies for overcoming that. Somebody asked me about how to become a mentor. Talk about making mm -hmm. more to have some of the opportunities that are interesting. Okay. Do you have any, like, you can, any questions you've been pulling up that you want to suggest? No, there is. Okay. Are there some questions people here have that they want to toss out? Okay, come on, face. Okay, sure. Okay, I'm going to jump back in again. Okay? okay, we're going to we're back. Uh, so it's great to see some of the discussion that's been going on. Um, I know that. One question was asked specifically since Aman mentioned that he's teaching at Olin, someone said they were interested in learning more about Olin, how it connects to this. It also made me realize 
when Iman mentioned that he teaches at Olin, I realized I was negligent. I never gave any background to the fact that the fact that uh, Aman now teaches at Olin and Karen now teaches at Harvard Graduate School of Education. I wish I could say I neglected to do that because I didn't want institutional affiliations to dominate the conversation. I wanted you to get to know them as people. But the fact is I just forgot. Uh, so there's a little quick background on them, but it would be great to hear. So Aman for the last couple of years has been at Olin, which does was set up just a number of years ago to try to have a very different approach to university education. Uh, so in what ways does the approach at Olin align with some of the things we've been discussing here? So uh, I can give a small sample that's related to our discussion and also point people to uh, a book called Creating Innovators. Tony Wagner spoke a lot about um, Olin in addition to the Media Lab uh, in that book. Um, but one thing that Olin has in, as part of its core is that you have the question of for an engineering education, do you have to teach all of the book knowledge in terms of do you have to know all the formulas and do you have to know, you know Bernoulli's equation and et cetera to graduate an engineer? Um, but there's a process that Olin goes through that takes you through a design stream where you it's a very project-based school by design and you're going to learn the things about working in teams together, working collaborative, not, not having the disciplines break you apart as a, it's an entire school. So that potentially comes at the cost of going through all of the concepts of a given major, but you're going to learn how to get that knowledge by going through the projects that you go through. So you're taken from your very first experience. You work on a team uh, four people and you learn something about nature and you design a toy for a fourth grader that has to do with um, you know, the way something swims or climbs on a wall or just like you see in nature. And then by the time you're a senior, you're doing enough engineering to work for uh, a capstone project that's brought to you by a company and it didn't come from let's lecture you about all the topics that you might need to know just in case you go through projects some of them are by your own choosing some of them are ones that we've uh, put you in a space where you're going to get the knowledge and go through the design process because engineering is about going through a process and design it's not necessarily just knowing uh, a set of things that you can bring to the table so only to set up in a way where you go through uh, this experience and you know that you're going to have the comfort of learning what you're going to need to know after the fact, even if it didn't come from all the projects that you accumulated in your four years. So it's probably trying to avoid the type of fragmented approach to knowledge, which is common in a lot of school settings, of trying to make it more integrated as part of a as part of a project. Indeed, and so I think that's just one of the strengths. There's many different components to it, but mm -hmm. relating to, like I was mentioning with the, the puppet slam, and um, just having some a project that has so many different capacities that you have to bring to bear, and you have to learn how to work with other people, those are going to be some of the skills that even the engineer needs um, to work with somebody that's entrepreneurial or work with someone that um, wants to think about the artistic elements. And because when you're out practicing, those are the teams that you're put on. It's not just somebody who's just like you going through the same slots that you're going through. I know another question that had come up in the chat was about combining the face to face and the online. And you had mentioned that some, Karen. Are there further reflections you have about trying to? integrate the two or, or how to get the best out of out of the two worlds? I don't know. It's ongoing. It's an yeah. ongoing challenge. I just, I don't think you, I don't think there's any choice about doing it. I mean, we don't live in one space or the other, so I think you have to think continuously, and I think there's enormous advantage to thinking across the spaces. Um, I think I saw that comment, but it's now yeah. lost. In okay, yeah, yeah, sure. But I, I think it's very true. You know, you go to a workshop, you have this maybe three-hour experience. Well, what do you do after that? Well, you want to connect to the people you met at the workshop. Maybe it's someone who lives just down the street from you. Maybe it's someone who is in the same school as you or, you know, is in a nearby town, and you can sort of amplify that. And I think that's true the computer clubhouse as well, that there's like this physical component, there's this online network, you have big events to celebrate milestones, and it's it's part of ritual and culture. And, and it goes in the day. opposite direction as well. I know some of the people that are been part the, doing online participants of learning creative learning have gone together with other local yeah. people who are following it to have the interactions that way as well. Oh. Were there other questions in the chat that you wanted to try to I am take now like totally overwhelmed by the yeah, number of questions. So. <laughs> well, there, there, there was one more that I remember okay, that I saw that <laughs> followed up from another point that you had, when you had uh, raised the issue of that in some school settings or formal settings that 
that students sometimes resisted when they were provided the opportunity to engage in more creative learning experiences. Yeah. And someone's asking for strategies for dealing with that. I do think this is an issue that come up here at MIT. I know that in some departments at MIT, they tried to change around some of the, uh, in the core science classes, to shift it around to have things that are less lecture-based and more project-based in some of the ways I think resonant with some of the things Aman was saying at Olin. And there was resistance from the students because I think they'd been very accustomed to, they ended up at MIT partly because they'd been very good at, you know, doing the classes while in high school. They were taught a certain way and shifting was, was, was something that was uncomfortable for them. Mm -hmm. So I think someone was asking, well, what are strategies if people are feeling uncomfortable? Yeah, I, I guess they're, so, as someone who tries to include this type of you know shift in my own teaching practice, I think there are two things. One is just having some humility as a designer that you may be making mistakes, that you may not be providing enough structure and support, um, and that that there is legitimacy to the discomfort. So just acknowledging yeah. that. Um, the other strategy, and I I have this very fundamental commitment to that all learning is rooted in relationships. And so if someone is really reacting badly to it, you know, how do you connect to that? that it isn't just about like the cognitive dimension, like oh, not mm -hmm. understanding. It's like, it's, you know, learning is dangerous, it's uncomfortable. And if you really want to engage people in meaningful learning experiences, you have to be able to, to support them through some of that like affective component yeah. as well. And so I think that's, that would be my advice. It's like, yeah. don't give up just because it's hard, yeah. because it is hard. So. And even though it was a little different, I remember actually in last week's class we specifically talked about you know being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Uh, that in some ways you a lot of the richest learning experiences you do have to go through things that you're not so familiar with, and you and ideally trying to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I I think that really sticks with me because it's something that I think I'm not so good at. It's something that I feel I have to continue to work at because when I am uncomfortable in that way, it rattles me somewhat and. And I wish I could do more just to embrace that type of uncomfortable feeling and just dive into it. So I don't know, thoughts you have on that? Well, maybe that's why we're a good team because I specialize in making people feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, but in seriousness, actually, I do. Th I picture you as someone who feels that you are someone who can feel comfortable being uncomfortable. That you'll sort of in, in something which is still a little bit chaotic and you're not quite sure, clear where it's going, feeling more comfortable in that setting. I think some of the technologies that we talked about in the course and some of the design principles behind things that I wanted to put on the table have the improvisation yeah. in it so that you know there's some discomfort in not knowing what's going to happen next yeah. but just if you go through that practice enough then you can embrace it in aspects of your life that are beyond just working on the project so I think uh, Eric is also a kindred spirit in that regard in terms of Makey Maker is the ultimate you know, tinkering and improvisation. So Eric and I actually improvise in music together and so I think just having that practice on the side helps you know, spill outside of the music domain or the technology domain and being uncomfortable with um, you know, you're just not knowing what to expect. And yeah. But actually that, that, I think that relates to a strategy I feel I sometimes have used is I try to make myself uncomfortable in places where I'm already pretty comfortable. So something that I already felt very comfortable with, it's easier to then be, take risks there. And that sort of helps me develop the risk-taking strategy because I'm sort of just reaching out from some place where I'm already somewhat comfortable. It lets me explore somewhat further and gradually get more and more comfortable with taking those risks and being uncomfortable with things. I am looking at the clock and I think I see it's you know, getting you know, close to the end of the hour. Uh, and I do want to give a little some words about looking ahead to next week. So I may well sort of Paul, I'll wrap up this section, but I really want to thank Karen and Aman uh, for coming and sharing some of their thoughts, and it's great to have you back, both coming back here, and it's great to continue to share ideas uh, with as you further develop them uh, around the great things you started with supporting creative learning. Any final words you want to say? Well, actually, I just saw this lovely line in the okay. chat that this is fundamentally about embracing process mm -hmm. and I think I think that's very true in terms of supporting creative learning experiences it's about being humble it's about being a bit daring yeah. being a bit uncomfortable um, but that acknowledging that it's, it's a process yeah. and uh, one thing I'll say is the landscape 
overall has to be the right time sometimes for some of these ideas to really take hold. And um, to answer one of the questions on the back channel earlier, I think we're at a point with this country where you know the entire system needs to grow as well and evolve. And uh, there's a lot of support for some of the things that we've been talking about. And um, a person that asked me, what are some opportunities to mentor? Um, there, an opportunity that was recently announced at the, the White House Science Fair was uh, similar to the Peace Corps, or something that you can do and go and help uh, develop a core of people to go do good for the world, or AmeriCorps, um, the Maker Corps, which is about making, and you could become a mentor, and there's ways that you can get involved with uh, camps that help you develop some of the maker minds, and then you can share that with other people. So that was something that got uh, backed by. Uh, our president recently, and so there's opportunities all around the country. So I don't know where that person is asking the question from, but there's probably a Maker Corps site near you. Yeah, man, if you just look online for Maker Corps, that's an initiative of the Maker Education Initiative. So if you just look up Maker Corps, Maker Education Initiative, people could find out more about that and get a good suggestion. Okay, let me just try to move that. Okay. So for next week, is our very final session of the course. And we're now thinking about it as looking back and looking forward. And we're going to be both reflecting on what's been happening over the last few months in this course, but also looking ahead about where we can, how we can build on the experiences uh, that we've had in this course. And part of it is we aren't going to have any outside guest panelists as we've had all the other weeks. The five of us who have been coordinating the course will be here sharing some of our reflections. But more importantly, all of you who have been participants in the course, it's really a time to get all of you actively engaged. We really want to use next week as some reflection time to hear from all the participants in the course about your experiences and your suggestions for moving forward. Uh, so that will be the focus for next week. In preparing for next week, we're going to have a few ways online for people to start sharing some of their reflections and looking forward. A couple of things we'll be sharing in the online, and you'll be getting this through your emails and on the Google Plus community. In the next day or two, we'll be circulating an online survey about the course, about which aspects of the course you found were most useful for you, what was not as useful for you, uh, and, and other questions like that. We really hope that people will fill this out, because as we've said all along, this course is a real learning experience for us. And we're going to learn a lot more by hearing from you about your experiences in the course. So I really hope people will take the time. It's just a short survey, just a few uh, questions to fill out. We really hope that you'll fill that out to let us know more about your experiences with the course. Also, we'll be trying to spark a discussion in the Google Plus community uh, for next week. And we'll post these uh, in the next couple of days, but I'll just give you a little foreshadowing here. The two main questions we're going to want people to be posting about in the coming week and then following up in discussions next Monday is we want to hear about how you plan to use the ideas from the course in your work or in other parts of your life. And we've already seen some of that about the ways people are doing different outreach efforts or taking some of the ideas or activities or technologies from the course into their practice. We'd love to hear more about what you're already doing or what you plan to do in using ideas technologies uh, and, and, other, and other practices from the course in your own work. The second question is how would you like to continue to interact with the learning, creative learning community? One thing I know as we've talked about it here at MIT, we started thinking about this as a course, the learning, creative learning course. We now think about it as a learning, creative learning community. We've really been excited about a lot of the ways people in the community have been interacting with one another, supporting one another, sharing ideas, suggesting things you know, with one another. And a lot of people have been saying that they would like to sustain this community, to continue to interact. And we'd like, love to hear more about what things you have in mind about the ways you'd love to continue to interact with the community. We're still trying to figure out things here about our role at MIT and about how we can help support the community over time. And we're thinking about a variety of things. You know, we might teach this course again, but that's not necessarily the right way to continue to support the community that is already existing. Uh, so we're trying to think, in addition to that, are there other things that we can do to work with 
all of you out there to help support uh, you know this community and to be part of it so that we can learn from this community and with this community over time. So those are some things that we want to be talking about in next week's final session of looking back and looking forward and to help plant some of the seeds for the discussion we hope in the Google Plus online community this week uh, that you'll be sharing some of your reflections both upon how you plan to use the ideas from the course and how you plan to, how you, how you would like to continue to interact with the learning, creative learning community. So we look forward to that final session next week and until next, uh, we hope you have a good week and see you next week on learning, creative learning. Thanks for joining us.